Hello everybody. My name is Alan Blomquist. I'm the engine and sort of the low-level programmer at indie game developer Tamar Corporation. And today I'm going to do a quick demo of some of our internal tools and specifically focus on programming and debugging. We've been developing games and a lot of the tools that we use to make them for over a decade now. And at this point we're using our own programming language, compiler front-end and back-end, editor, debugger, build system, and game engine. I got really interested in working on stuff like this when I read uh, years and years ago, it must have been a blog post or something, about this thing called Goal that they developed at Naughty Dog for some of their PS2 games. And it was like a custom programming tool chain. And I remember reading about that and just thinking that this is obviously like the coolest thing that I've ever heard of. It didn't seem like something that you could even do. So that really made an impression on me and kind of showed me my own lack of imagination at the time. Um, but fast forward to four or five years ago now, and I got a chance to work on something like that for our own company. And it's kind of become like a passion project for me. So I'm excited to show off some of the cool things that I think we've been able to come up with. For this demo, I'm going to use a port that I made of one of our games, Human Resource Machine, that wasn't originally created using these tools, but I wanted to have a real finished game to use here and not just like a toy example. Also, this game happens to be a game about programming, but this demo is about our development environment in general, and so it would apply equally well to any of our games. I'm going to start with just sort of the basic version of what a lot of the rest of this stuff is going to be based on. This is the only non-code part of the demo where I'm going to show off my art skills and do a simple hot load of a data asset. So if I bring up a texture from the game here and I make an edit and save it, then we can see that it shows up here in the game without having to stop and restart it. So that's a nice feature to have, but now we're going to build off that idea and see what else we can do. I'll open up our code editor here and we'll see if we can't do something a little more interesting. This is the code that's drawing these green boxes over on the left side here. And since we hot loaded data, it's only fair that we hot load code. So if I make an edit here, we can see that that gets hot loaded too. Our compiler is incremental and it builds native code pretty fast. So we can compile on every keystroke and there's almost no delay between me typing into the editor and the changes showing up in the game, even in this kind of ridiculous 13,000 line source file. If I navigate over to the code that's drawing the floor here with these blue boxes, we can see some debugging features. If I set a breakpoint at the top of this function, you can see that the scene is kind of partially drawn in right now. And then as I step through here, I can see the different things that I'm drawing showing up on the screen as I go. Since this is our own debugger talking to our own game engine, we can kind of arrange to keep the screen alive while you step through code, sort of like a graphics debugger, and that can come in handy sometimes when you're trying to figure out where some stray little thing on the screen is coming from. Another thing I can do while I'm stepping through my code here is actually do a step backwards. I can do backwards versions of the usual step in, step over, step out, and I can run backwards to my breakpoint, and I can also run backwards to hardware data breakpoints. And being able to debug backwards from an assert or a crash, especially with a data breakpoint, is insanely helpful in being able to figure out and fix bugs. And one of the keys to making this as practically useful as possible is that this isn't a special mode that I launched the game into in order to do this kind of debugging. This is just the way it works all the time, so you always have this option available while you're working. So I'll switch over to the game window now, and we can look at our in-game profiler. Uh, by default, the instrumentation for the profiler doesn't get compiled in, but when I click Enable here, we do a full recompile of the game code, and now we're getting our call graph instrumentation. And it looks like there are some spikes happening on some of these frames, so I'll pause this data collection so we can take a closer look. If I look at the frame that got expensive here, there's this one function taking up most of the time. And normally in a profiler, you can click on the name of the function and go see the source code, and I can do that here. But since we can debug backwards, another thing that I can do is click on this timestamp up here. 
And when I do that, I'm taken to the actual invocation of this function on this frame, and I can debug and see that the reason that this took so long this time is that I got an unlucky random number. Now obviously this is a contrived example, and this isn't a silver bullet for every possible kind of performance issue, but it's a cool additional tool, and it can be really useful for certain kinds of situations. So once I resume this, and get rid of this bad code here, then the profile looks good, and I can compile out the instrumentation code, and we can keep going. So the profiler can tag function activations with these timestamps for debugging, but that's also something that you can do yourself in code. For example, a lot of the time if you create something at one point in a program and it needs to be cleaned up later, you tag it with some kind of debug information so you know where it came from. So memory allocations are a thing like that, where you'd normally tag those with like a file name and a line number, or if you're lucky, you can tag them with a call stack, and it makes it easier to debug memory leaks and stuff like that. So here in our programming language, we have something like an intrinsic that when it gets evaluated at runtime, it gives you the current execution timestamp, and you can use that to tag stuff with instead. So I'll break into the game here, and I'm going to look at the data for the boxes that I put on the conveyor belt to solve this level. So I can see that there are three of them here. And if I look at the middle one I threw on, here's the timestamp I associated with it. And then I can use that to go back and look at the point in time when that box was actually thrown onto the conveyor. And if I undo that, I can go back and look at a different one and see what was going on when I threw that one on. So that's an example of the kind of thing that I might tag in this sort of game, but in other games you might tag the creation of all your bad guys, or remember the last time the player got hit, or track the history of every door that you walk through, or whatever else you can think of. These timestamps are super cheap to generate, and they're only 64 bits, so you can use them to tag pretty much everything with what effectively is the entire state of the program. And then you can go back later and inspect anything you need to if you want to find out where something came from or why it didn't get cleaned up or whatever you want to know. So finally, now we're going to turn the determinism knob all the way up to 11. So when I come in here and bring up our developer console in the game, we have a scrubber and some playback controls down here. And this timeline has everything that I just did during this demo, and I can use it to go back and sort of inspect any part of it that I'm interested in. And this isn't like a video that we're looking at. This is the actual simulation and rendering of the game happening on demand. This all still works even though I did stuff during the demo like fully recompile the code for the profiler, I edited the code for these boxes, and I changed this texture but I can still scrub back and forth through all those different changes. I specifically wanted to try not to have one-way streets in this functionality, so using one feature doesn't rule out using a different one later on. So if I go back to before I changed the code for these boxes, if I come in here and I debug this now, I can see that this is the original version of the code before I changed it. And that's because the editor is aware of this whole system, and it always lets me work with the state of the code as it was at the time that I'm looking at. I could also go back and profile code after the pact. If I'm playing along and I see a weird hitch or something like that, I don't have to start thinking about how to reproduce it. I can just go back and see what it was. And the point of all this isn't that I'm just dying to go back and debug my stale code. The point is that the system as a whole is a coherent set of features that all work together. So if you've worked with other determinism-based replay systems, one of the issues that they tend to have is that they feel really fragile, and you have to have constant vigilance that you don't do something that's going to break the determinism. But in our case, since we've created every level of this stack to support this, we can super efficiently offload the determinism stuff to the development environment, and essentially you can just write whatever code you want without having to spend any time thinking about whether or not you're breaking something. 
The other cool thing about this is that we save a session file with this timeline every single time you run the game. And since this whole thing is integrated with our version control, the amount of data we actually need to save to be able to replay a timeline stably at any point into the future is really small. And it's not just programmers who are generating these session files, it's everybody on the team, and the files are portable. So if you're a designer working on a level and something isn't working quite right when you try it in the game, or you just randomly saw something weird happen and you want somebody to look into it, you can send your session to anyone else and they can play it back live and debug it. And this is all integrated with our build system so that it all just works even if you had local changes when you created the session and the person playing it back is on a different revision and source control and they have their own local changes. The system can get all the data it needs to play back the session and it doesn't touch any of my actual local files in the process so there isn't any risk of me losing work if something went wrong. So I have a session here that I have prepared ahead of time and uh, we can imagine that somebody sent this to me to look at because their game crashed. So I'll load this up and I'll run it to the end and sure enough they got an access violation here and you can see that the boss from Human Resource Machine lives on our panic screen and he's not happy with me right now. So one thing I can do is just sort of go back through this session and look at what happened. So it looks like somebody played through the level once, they went back and sort of optimized their solution, played through it again, and then got this crash. So if I click on the top of the call stack here, I'm taken into the code editor, and if I got an access violation on this line, that probably means that this pointer is null. And I know that this is a parameter to this function. So I'll do a reverse step out of the function. And here I am back before I called into it. And here we're passing the null pointer in. And I can see that that pointer is supposed to get set up in this if block, uh, depending on if you're in normal play mode or playing on the phone. And if I look at the current value of this play mode variable, the debugger is saying that the value it has is not actually a valid member of the enumeration. And if you look at the bit pattern here, you might recognize that that's the floating point number one. So at this point you're thinking, this looks like a memory stomp and I better cancel my plans because who, long, who knows how long it's going to take me to figure this out. But what I can do here is bring this play mode variable into my watch window and I can set a data breakpoint on it. And now when I run backwards, I'm going to find the most recent write that happened into that memory. And it looks like that was right here. I'm assigning the value 1.0 to something, so that makes sense. And if I go back a couple more, it looks like the index I was using to write into this buffer started at 15. It incremented to 16 compared to the capacity, which is also 16. So this should have wrapped around here, but it didn't. And it looks like this is the bug here. This greater than should have been a greater than or equal to. So obviously, again, this was a contrived example, but this isn't a totally unheard of kind of bug, unfortunately. And you can imagine that if I were attacking this with printfs or something instead, I might be in for kind of a long night. Luckily, though, most bugs aren't even that complicated. They're just like run-of-the-mill logic errors in gameplay code or something. So being able to debug those with this kind of system makes it super easy. So that brings me to the end of the demo. Um, check out the links in the description for more great information about Tomorrow Corporation. And thank you for watching.